So, <clears throat> I'm Jose. Hello. And I just want to start off by saying that I'm the kind of person that doesn't get nervous before something. It could be the biggest thing in the world. It's when it's happening that I get nervous. So, if you can't tell, I'm shaking internally. Uh, but our, I think hopefully as we go, it'll be better and better. It'll get better. Yeah, so I'm Jose. I have been with Challenge since 2015, I think. So it's been a while. It's been like five years. And I came as a sophomore, uh, just kind of leaving class late. Saw them outside in like Scripps Cottage area. I don't know if you guys have been around there, but it looked really nice, looked cool, logo looked sick. So I showed up. And uh, ever since then, I've been stuck with these guys, uh, following closely behind Josh and Kevin. Uh, Sarah, I remember David Morgan, and, and Dana was very involved too, and Ryan Wheeler, a bunch of good people. Um, but, oh, those were the days too when I used to bring like a whole drum set and like cables and all this stuff, like super, yeah, it was, it was, it was work, but it was fun. It was good work. Um, yeah, it was a good, uh, let's see if we could segue this. Good, good work, good discipline, and in that discipline, there was liberty. I see that? Yeah, you catch that. That was such a smooth segue there. Okay, so yeah, so what I want to start with is, uh, just to preface it, the talk that I have today is, I'm, I have it broken up in three sections, uh, talking about liberty and in regards to before we come to Christ, second section is going to be once we've come to Christ, and the third section is when we are in Christ, and I'm going to try to uh, do as best as I can. This is my first time doing this, so if I say anything weird, you can ask me later and I'll try to clarify, but just try to go with the scripture because this isn't wrong. So if I say something weird, check it. So, okay, cool. So I'm just going to jump into it the only way I know how to do. And we are going to start with, <clears throat> I'm going to read John, I think it's on your handout there, John 8, chapter 8, verses 31 through 38 for some context. And then we'll jump to that first section, that first third I was talking about. <clears throat> All right. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. I speak of what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. Okay, cool. So, here we go. And one more thing I can guarantee you 100% is that I'm not going to finish <laughs> on time for sure. Okay, I'm either going to be over time or under time. So, that's the only thing guarantee I have for you guys. But here we go. So <clears throat> what I want to see here is the first thing we see as a life before a Christian, meaning an unbeliever, a sinner, unrepentant. In, ver in verse 34, we see this uh, idea of practicing sin, right? And those that practice sin are slaves to sin. Now, I wanted to define terms here a little bit with what it's saying when it's saying practicing sin, because there is, uh, it's not to say that once you're a Christian that you don't sin or that you can't sin. Um, I know some areas they believe that I don't think we believe that here um, but what I want to make a difference here is uh, the word practice right um, and it might sound weird because I'm going to use the word improve and sin in the same section in the same sentence so just but just hear me out so uh, when you guys I'm sure there's athletes here right I know Tanner used to do rugby I'm sure you still stay active Cam looks like an athlete I don't know if you are uh, but I'm sure all you guys if you worked at any hobby or any sport you practice right you practice to do better at that uh you find new ways to do the same thing better uh if it is i don't know why soccer keeps coming up to mind but if, it, if it's soccer you look like okay i make the goal in the middle and i want to get that angle that 90 in the corner you're looking for better ways to improve ways to do it easier and you look to people that have been in the sport longer or in the hobby longer to learn how they have done it right you practice to do better at that now like i preface it's going to sound a little weird when i put this in the same senses but in the same way when we practice our, when we practice sin, when we're in sin, uh, in the flesh, we learn new ways to improve that sin. To, uh, to for example, like if some like uh, premarital sex, right, with one person. Okay, cool. Let, how do you improve that sin? Oh, well, with more people than just one person. Or if uh, you're stuck in addiction of one drug, you improve the sin by doing more drugs, not the one you're just on. Or uh, 
looking to others that have been living that lifestyle longer than you have to adopt their lifestyles, right? This is something that we see in what I'm trying to explain with practicing sin. Now, the difference with Christians is that we do sin, but only by the nature that we are in this fleshly, weak body. That every day we battle against this flesh, and every day we have to bring it to the cross and, and kill it, essentially. So, <clears throat> that's kind of the difference that I want to make before I went any farther with that. Um, the other difference, too, is that there is a conviction for our sins. There should be a conviction. In the practice of sin, there is no conviction. You're looking for ways to do more of that. There is no uh, contrition or feeling weird about it. Um, <clears throat> and for a Christian, it should be very awkward and very difficult. And very, uh, you should feel bad when you're doing it. And it, it still does happen, you know. Um, but the thing that we bring it to Christ is not our habit. It's not our lifestyle. And it's not our tendency anymore. Okay, so as I set that part up with practicing sin makes you slave to sin, and we're talking about liberty, obviously the, what comes opposite of liberty would be enslavement or, or constraint. Now I wanted to talk, uh, I wanted to read over to my next point. I wanted to read from, and I know on the handouts I think there's not a lot, there's like spaces, so if you see a verse or something, just jot it down. Um, <clears throat> Ephesians 2, 1 through 3 reads, um, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the prince that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Now, this is part of what Kevin used last week. He used this, uh, the bigger passage of this, but uh, and that, that makes sense. What we're going to see here is that Without life, there is no liberty, and then without liberty, there is no happiness. So there is a, there is a, a there's something to the three being united in, in this series we're doing. <clears throat> but what I want to focus on is here falling in this passage. We see it talks about falling the course of this world, right? What looks like freedom in this world. So being free or going with the flow or doing as the majority does is what is freeing in the eyes of this world, falling the course of this world, right? Living in disobedience, uh, it may seem like it's more freeing to do what you want. It may seem like you have more liberty than ever to do whatever you want with no one telling you what to do or stopping you. Um, and as we're going to see later, I'll bring some examples where we'll see that there are consequences there. And you see that it really is just enslavement. It is not freedom. Uh, but it does look like it, quite like it. And it, it, in a way, it doesn't make a lot of sense to live a life of obedience and get more freedom. It, it seems to be at odds. But it isn't. And we'll, we'll get to that too. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. <clears throat> oh, it doesn't want to go away. <clears throat> I'm fine, guys. I'm okay. I promise. That's sketch these days. You can't, like, sneeze in public now. You know? I feel like that, si that scene in, uh, what is it, Monsters, Inc., where all those yellow guys come and pile on? Yeah. That's what it feels like. Don't shave me. Okay. Let's see. <laughs> I should just stop talking. <laughs> Okay, that's my place, guys. Where are we? Seems like doing. Okay, yeah. Okay, cool. So that was that was that was it. That was the point for Ephesians. Um, to set up the next part, which is in Second Peter, uh, it's going to be specifically verse two, uh, eighteen from chapter two. I said that so backwards. Second Peter chapter two verse eighteen. But for some context, I'm going to read Second Peter seventeen through twenty-two. So follow with me um, or listen. These are waterless springs and mists driven by a storm. For them, nice. These are waterless springs and mists driven by a storm. For them, the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. For speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. For if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The last state has become worse than, for them than the first. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit, and the sow, after washing herself, returns to wall in the mire. So here we see, kind of divided into two sections, the first part of of what it is to be enslaved to sin. The second one, once it seems like someone has come to know Christ, but we'll get to the second part in a little bit. 
What I want to focus on here is 2 Peter uh, to the verse 18, <clears throat> um, sensual passion. So I read this and I was kind of trying to figure out what is going on here, because usually in my head when I see sensual, I'm thinking sexual. It's very like you see those two words a lot together whenever the word sensuality is brought up or something. So I looked it up and we're looking really at just gratification of the senses or the indulgence of appetite. All right, so senses being taste, sight, hearing, touch, and seeing right, are, are normal, what we all have, well, most of us have. Um, and what it is is really just fulfilling these passions as, as you please, living a hedonistic lifestyle with these passions. So what it is, it is something where the world will entice you with, with what you see, right? You see on TV or you see people uh, living a certain way or the trend of that week for how you're going to dress or the trend for what uh, what place to go eat or what to go do. It's it's what you see, right? Or hearing. Now, I, I like music. I'm a musician. Um, I like jazz and I, I, <laughs> I like jazz and um, I was thinking about the B movie, you know, you like jazz, but <laughs> but I, I like jazz. That's my music. But I do like hip hop and 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 that stuff too. And and those things, it's very easy to get caught up in what you hear in terms of a good beat, you know, percussive lyrics. But you don't really sometimes pay attention to what the lyrics say. And those things entice you with a beat or with a quote groove or something. And I'm not saying that you know we shouldn't listen to anything that doesn't say the word Jesus in it or something. I'm not opposed to that. The, the issue is we have to see what are we filling ourselves more with um, and, and entice or fulfilling those enticements that uh, those those central passions, right? Um, which lure us in very easily and we get stuck in enslavement, right? And when we're look, when we're working towards freedom and towards liberty, we say we're more free, right? We say, oh, it's more free if I do whatever I want, if I watch whatever I want. Um, but really, <clears throat> At the end of the day, I know for me, with uh, things that I, I've seen or done or hung out with people, at the end of the day, you're like, what did I do that? It doesn't even feel great to do this or to see this or to behave this way. So what I want to show here is that, um, I think that was it. <laughs> but, but one more thing about that is that we see in that same verse, uh, barely escaping is that little phrase shown there where it says, um, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. So I focused on this because I was thinking, most people, right, we live a life outwardly and then we live a life inwardly that people don't know, right? We have a whole different set of thoughts in here, a whole different set of feelings in our heart than what we let onto other people in social events or in, in hangouts. And so we may make it seem like, oh, I'm having a blast, I'm doing this. But I know for me, uh, when I started as a freshman, uh, I hung out with groups that I shouldn't have hung out with, did things I shouldn't have done. And at the end of the day, personally, I wanted to escape it. It didn't feel like something that I wanted to be in. But the thing is, it's not enough to just escape, right? You gotta move towards something. And everyone is trying to escape, looking for liberty, but the issue is, where are you looking for that liberty? What, what or what do you think liberty is, right? And that question we'll come back to in a little bit. Um, is everyone following me so far? You doing good? Okay. Um, this is what it feels like when no one said anything. Okay, I get it now. Oh, okay. All right, right now. Okay, good, good, good. Okay. <laughs> All right, cool. And then that second, uh, the verse right after that one in Second Peter, the same chapter two, verse nineteen, we see it says, "They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved." So here, it's it's kind of funny or peculiar to see that these same people that is talking about people that go with their sensual passions and desires are already enslaved and these enslaved people are the ones trying to tell you hey this is freedom right they're the ones who are promising you freedom it says they promise you freedom all right um now not too long ago i went on a biking trip with micah and kevin where are you micah where hey. you? there you are i went with micah and kevin and uh his name was kenny right the guy we went with yeah, kenny. kenny we had this guy named kenny and we had this conversation that to me now when you see it it's like very awkward but it's a normal conversation. We were going up on this, uh, the lift that takes like forever. And we were talking about relationships, uh, you know, cause guys, you know, for the boys. So we're talking about like girls and stuff. Um, but when Kenny talked about, <laughs> when Kenny brought up girls, he was asking me and I, I mentioned, oh, by the way, I, I know none of you know, but this is my fiance up here. I know I've never said it, but okay. anyway, I was talking about her and I was talking about 
how amazing it is that we are deciding to honor God with our relationship and, and wait on his timing for everything that comes with it. You guys know what it's all. Uh, and, and, and what Kenny said, Kenny says, oh, no, not me, man. Like, I could never settle down unless I've test driven. Right? And it's a very common thing you hear in, in, in the world. And, and no one's like, what? And everyone's like, oh, for sure, dude, I get it. That's, that's a very common promise given from those that are enslaved already. That, that the promise is like, oh no, you won't, you, you should live with that person first to know if you should marry them. Or you should sleep with that person first to know if you guys are compatible in that way. That's the promise, right? And it seems enticing, you're like, oh dude, that makes a lot of sense. Like, why would I, you know, what if it gets that, da, da, da. You elevate things in certain perspectives that aren't as important as you think they are, right? And that's one promise that I've come across. Another thing you hear is, oh, you're not, you haven't done this yet? Oh dude, are you even living? You haven't done this or this or X or Y or Z. That's another promise that if you do these things, you will have freedom. And, and I don't want you guys to forget that what I'm saying is that this comes from people that are already enslaved in this, trying to promise you freedom, right? Or go to more parties and live in the moment because the people here in this party are gonna be friends with you forever. I know there's some people that I've met five years ago that I've never talked to again, that when things got hard, they were out. You know, never the people that have stuck around are very counted on one hand of anything, excluding like my immediate family. It'd be five people maybe, right? So all these promises are so empty and we don't see it because it's very enticing. It's very logical from a secular worldview. It makes a lot of sense from a secular worldview. Um, <clears throat> another thing, uh, even for me that I kind of felt was as a freshman, usually you're like, oh, freedom. I get to go. I don't have to live in the house. I don't have to do chores. I don't have to do this, I don't have to do that, my dad's restrictive, my mom won't let me do this. And so the idea is you talk to your friends and of course your friends are on the same border. They're like, oh dude, just like do when you turn 18, get out of there, right? And it feels like your parents are enslaving you with the only mistake your parents have ever done is ever loved you, right? If, I mean, I know there's exceptions with some bad parents, but overall, all they have is love for you. And maybe they're bad at expressing it, maybe they're bad and it does come too controlling. But it's not out of like wanting to enslave you. It's out of a love. And, and I want to make that clear because in the same way, our father has that fatherly love for us. That it isn't that you, we, that they want the, we, I'm not a dad, that, that they want bad for you, right? They want good for you, but for you, like, I'm too restricted. I'm too constrained. There's too much law here. When really this, these constraints are what bring you freedom, what keep you safe from the damages of going off on your own and doing things that you shouldn't be doing. Right? So I, I may have already been too long on this little section, but that's what I wanted uh, to hone in on here, that these promises are given by people that are already blind to their own situation. Right? A blind person can't leave another blind person. Right? Now, <clears throat> that's your life before. You're a slave to sin. You cannot see the slave, the enslavement you are in, in sin. You can't see and you think you're actually in liberty. You think because you're doing what you want, you are free. Right? So now we move on to the second third of what happens when we come to Christ. So when we make him our king in our lives. Right? So we read John 8, uh, that passage 31 to 38. So now focusing on 35 to 36, it says, uh, The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. All right? So what, what, what are we now? What happens once we have come to Christ? Right? It says here, if the sun sets you free, you're free indeed. It's as simple as that. It's a simple thing, and yet it is uh, difficult for us to do with our own fleshly desires, right? It says here that true liberty is being set free, not through the things you can do in life, but through the sun, what he does, right? And so we're always thinking, what can we do to feel more free? What can we do to show freedom to others that we're doing great, you know? And here it says you, you can't do it. You're only free if the sun sets you free. Right? Now there's nothing, absolutely nothing we can do to be free. <clears throat> and I don't want that to sound that hopeless. That's a, that's a message of freedom. That the pressure is off. That, that Christ is the only one that can set us free and give us true liberty and, and, and sight to see that true liberty. Um, now, I'll come back to that. But for Second Peter, I'm going to read Second Peter chapter 2, 17 through 22. And I have some fat chunks here, but the thing is, I, I, I think it's important to take it in this context of six or seven verses at a time and then break it down. So I'll read it real quick. Second Peter chapter 2, 17 through 22. <clears throat> there are waterless springs and mist driven by a storm. For them, the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. For speaking loud boast. No, I already read this, didn't I? Dude, who's, who's switching my notes up, man? 
No, I already read this. I read this. So, um, but what I want to focus on is Second Peter, that same passage, but verses 20 and 21. So let me fast forward to that. We're doing great. For if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the last day has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. Now, remember, we're in the section of once we come to Christ. And so the reason why I read those two verses in that passage is that um, once we come to Christ, we need to move away from those worldly influences. Uh, when we have now been, uh, the band has been taken off our eyes, we need to not necessarily never talk to those people, but we need to be able to measure how much influence they're having on us and if it's too much to set aside. Because here we're seeing that <clears throat> though we've been set free, our last state can be worse than the first once we've known we've come to knowledge. Um, it's a lot harder. <laughs> it's a lot more painful. And, so, and I bring this up because I know for me, when, when I came, I lived in a Christian household growing up. But there comes a point where you got to make a decision where you got to, you really have to believe it, not kind of believe it, or believe that your parents believe it, but you believe it, right? Or don't. That's the decision that has to happen, to believe it or not to believe it. And so I, I read this, this passage here because I remember um, when I came new, and it really my, my uh, thank God for challenge, because really a lot of my growth happened uh, with, with you guys, with challenge here. Um, but that was, the, that was the difference maker right there, that being an infant, a new, a new baby Christian, one needs to be strengthened and with a group of other free people, of other people that have come to know what liberty is, liberty of sin. And so I just wanted to hit that real quick because I know, I know we've had like some recent uh, people come to Christ, right? We had Arian, right? And then we had Riley, right? Where are you, back there? So yeah, so I, I was thinking about that because that's what it is, we are new. We are new to this and so we need to be very careful um, what we're doing, what we're hanging out with, to not awaken and stir those desires that we have now, that Christ has put to death, right? That's just a little, a little thing that I was thinking about, baby Christians, <clears throat> or infant Christians. Um, all right, so now, and I don't think I've read this one, Romans, I'm going to go into Romans chapter 6, 15 through 23. Have I read it? No? Okay. How much time has passed? Not enough. Okay, here we go. So, <laughs> Romans 6, 15 through 23. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. Bear with me. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So, a little long, but like I said, it's, it's powerful. It cuts, it cuts out my work for me, really just reading that passage. But <clears throat> I want to focus now on Romans 6, 15 through 16, those two verses there, where we are slaves of the one we obey, right? Now, naturally, there is there is true freedom and true liberty, but naturally, we have to be yoked to something. We are made to be followers of something if it is not of our own selves or of Christ, right? And so, freedom of obeying ourselves isn't really freedom. Uh, we aren't obeying ourselves as much as we are obeying the sin in our flesh that's making us prisoners to sin, right? It may seem like, oh, I'm free because I'm doing what I want, but really you're only doing what you can do. It's not that you're free, it's not by decision, but really that's all you have, is that fleshly desire to follow what you want to do, which makes you a slave. So it may seem when you don't pay attention or don't look at it that it is freedom to do whatever you want. But as we see, uh, it really just leads to more corruption and more, more enslavement. 
not freedom, which is what we're trying to get to. And so really, I think this whole message has been more about what liberty isn't. Uh, but we will get eventually to what liberty is. Um, <clears throat> oh, man. I'm okay, guys. I'm okay. If it keeps moving this. Okay. Uh, and if we become slaves to obedience, then we are led to righteousness, is what it says here. Um, and we see also in Romans, in that same passage, verse 22 says that, says, but now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. Right? So here we see that that freedom, that true liberty is eternal life. We, we, and, and that leads into the next part of what I want to talk about, talk about is that third section with Christ. What freedom isn't once we're in Christ and what it is. <clears throat> now this came to mind like... I was thinking of two sections really, and then I thought there is still a third section when we are in Christ and we come to Christ, where just by nature of being humans and being fleshly, we are looking for ways to earn things. It's very really hard for us to understand that there are some things that we can't earn because in the life we live, everything is earned, right? Uh, 20 bucks to get here, 20 bucks to get back on gas, uh, it might be less. Um, but everything costs something. We earn everything, we work. No one really just gives you money. And even if they did give you money, it cost that person, you know? So it's really hard for us to understand that part. And so what I wanted to talk about with once we're in Christ, we need to, um, this is the stage now we are living by grace, but we need to be cautious not to fall into a life of works-based faith, right? Which is another form of slavery. And we're going to see that right here, where um, it may be harder to catch sometimes because we have, we have come to know Christ, um, but there's still, there's still work to be done. Okay, so... Galatians 5.1. Many of you know this one. And it reads, uh, For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Cool, so let's break it down, right? So who sets us free? Right? It, it, it says Christ. right? Not, not us or what we do, but Christ sets us free. Okay. <laughs> so what? Who cares? What does that mean? It means that Christ did the hard work. In fact, not the hard work, but he did the impossible work that we couldn't do. Amen. Right? He did what we could never do in our whole lifetime. He did with his lifetime. And we must stand firm on that truth. We must stand firm that there is nothing we could do once coming to Christ to earn salvation or to be more sanctified. Of course, there are things that we do to be more sanctified, but it comes out of a nature of knowing that we've been saved, not that we are trying to get saved through what we do. Right? And so when it, sa it says here too, also do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Submission, right? That we would go back on our own will to this. To, to go back to thinking that works um, could set us free <clears throat> or make us more holy. Uh, now, like I said, there is a fruit of, there is fruit of, of salvation that comes out as works, but not the other way around that works get you there, right? I'm trying, maybe I'm confusing more for you guys, but hopefully not. Um, And like I said earlier, we always, we should be yoked, right? It isn't enough for us to be set free from the law. We must be yoked to Christ and what he has done for us. We must be yoked to his yoke, which is easy, and, and follow his teachings, right? We can't just be like, okay, well, I'm not yoked to uh, slavery of sin or to, um, to the law, but we have to be yoked to someone. And I, I don't know if Matt's here, but... Is he here? I don't see him. Oh, he is. He's right there. Right behind Tedder. Something that Matt always says that I've heard a lot, and, and it really uh, resonates with me, is uh, when we've gone out to do gospel appointments um, or to evangelize, he says, I wouldn't want anyone to run my life if he can't run it better than I can. Right? And there is no one that can run it better than you can, any human, uh, besides Christ. Christ is the only one that can run our lives better than we are running it. Right? And so, if... There is someone to be yoked to, it is Christ, right? We will always win, we will always be fine, we will always be free if we are in Christ. Now James 1.25 says, But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Now, like I said in the beginning, in the world, in the secular worldview, it seems like less law is more free. But really, it's more of obedience and of, of, uh, of standards that give us more freedom. So 
here, the law of liberty. So there is a law of liberty, and the law is one. Uh, the law is one of liberty when it comes along with the word of the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit to change the heart. It cannot be just for being law as it is. It is powerless, and it does not free you unless it comes through the power of the gospel and with Christ. Right um, now, true freedom, true liberty, is freedom to obey God and do what pleases Him. The law of Christ provides freedom through sin, uh, from sin through the gospel. That's what that does. Um, and I feel like I missed a few other points, but I didn't write them down. I should have wrote them down. Okay, um, and then. Um, so what, one little thing I wanted to share before before I close, it's 8.30. Before I finished up, uh, is I've been blessed enough to, like I said, been born in a Christian home. And you guys have probably heard my testimony if you guys went to um, one of the things we had. We had something. Anyway. Fall retreat. The fall retreat. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. All right. The thing is, I've, I've been able to see it, though. I've been able to learn from observation. And I've seen the family that my dad has come from and the family that my mom have, has come from. And in their lives, my, my grandpa from my dad's side and, and my grandpa from my mom's side, freedom, like I was saying, especially for, for at least from what I know about, I can only speak of what I know, right, of, of men, is that it's very normal in the secular world to see that especially in the Hispanic community, to the more wives you have, it's fine, you know, you, you leave that one, you get another one. And it seems free in their eyes, in the sake of your worldview, that you're not, you're not uh, tied down to anything or anyone. But there is so much repercussion and so much damage that is done, where to the point where when my grandpa, my dad's dad passed away, instead of worrying about like, oh, our dad passed away, they were fighting over who got what. Because there was three different families, and there were so there were kids from different different moms, and yeah, the the guy my dad was able to bring uh, share the gospel with my grandpa, and, and he came to know Christ. But even on his deathbed, he said, "You know what, son?" He said, "Don't do what I did. Everything I taught you my your whole life as a kid, erase it, erase it, because because what I did was damaging." And I don't he didn't see it until the very end. And even then, I mean, praise God that he had breath to recognize that. But the issue is that you see at the end of your life that really there was no freedom in those things that we do, right? In, in, in living a life like that or a life of, of, of empty parting or, or hanging out or you looking for the new euphoric moment of today, right? All right, one more thing I want to read here. Galatians 4, 1 through 7. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave. Though he is the owner of everything, but he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father, in the same way we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, <clears throat> born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, so you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. So just breaking this down a little bit. We go from being enslaved to, how we already mentioned sin, enslaved also to the law without Christ, to being free in Christ with the law, fulfilled through Christ, and we have now become sons and heirs. We know that, like I mentioned earlier, true liberty is eternal life, right? And, oh, that's what I was going to mention. Where'd it go? Where'd it go? I know it's somewhere in here. Maybe it'll come up. I'll see. Okay. Yeah, so we are now heirs through Christ. We are now heirs through that promise of eternal life, of salvation. And that, as a Christian, gives us liberty to live because we are not fearing death. We're not afraid of death. I'm trying to find out. I don't know where I had it somewhere in here about being uh, enslaved because you're fearing death. Dang, I don't know where it went. It was really good, too. I'm going to try to summarize it. Uh, pretty much this, this, this scripture, I'm going to have to find it, <laughs> was saying... <clears throat> that many fear uh, death and so are enslaved to uh, a lifetime of slavery because they fear death. And that makes a lot of sense, right? In, in this world where time is flying so back, past so f flying by, past so, <laughs> passing, <laughs> oh man. <clears throat> passing by so flying far, fast? Okay, hold up. I'm not stroking, I promise. <laughs> flying by 
so fast. <laughs> I think I was trying to do fine and passing at the same time. Okay. Flying by or passing by super fast. We realize that our years are are passing by so fast and we're like, are we gonna leave something? Because we the, we wanna avoid the question of what happens when we take our last breath, right? We wanna live in this moment and see like, how can I live a, leave a mark now, leave an impact and have people know who I was? And so there's just this, this anxiety over that and this enslavement to that desire of trying to leave a mark because you're worshiping yourself, right? You're trying to leave something and you're so worried that you're like, when I die, this is all gone. I need to make sure it leaves something. And here we are free from that worry. We are, we are promised eternal life through liberty through Christ. That worry is gone. We don't live our lives now based on anxiety of what we want to do or what we want to do in this moment that it has to be amazing or oh, I don't want to do it. The, now, living as a Christian is awesome. I know I, people have said we're boring, but I don't think we're boring. I think we're pretty dang awesome, right? We have, we have an awesome time and we have what Kevin mentioned earlier. That's what I was saying. It's tied. We have now a purpose, right? He talked about real life is having a purpose. And with that purpose comes a peace, comes a love, and we are now able to uh, follow in the liberty that God has given us. We have this freedom to worship him and to live life, not for us, but for him. And it, 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 people that don't have that, from the, that have not come to know Christ, see it as like, you guys are so restricted. You guys don't do this, you guys don't do that. And as my pastor has said too, it's not really that we can't, but that we don't want to anymore. It's not in our in our hearts to want to do something that is against uh, what we have learned uh, is correct in, in God's eyes, in Christ's eyes. It's not that we can, but it, is, it isn't beneficial to us. It isn't good. And we know that it's enslaving, right? And so our job is to help those friends that we know that don't see that, to preach the gospel to them. And it always comes back to the gospel, which brings freedom, right? We can't, like I said earlier, we can't do anything. You can't do anything for your friend. You can even share the gospel and even that, God still has to do it. And, and God does want, want us to do it, but you cannot save your friend, right? You what, you what we can do is share the gospel, share it clearly, and have God do the rest because we don't have that power, right? And, and thank God that that is off our backs. You know, that is not on us, but we have to be obedient to that. Um, and hopefully, the, it was more, I think, of what liberty wasn't, but hopefully through that, you were able to see what liberty is and the freedom we have in Christ knowing that our destination is set, that he has conquered death, and we don't have to be worried about it. And just got to share the gospel and get it out there. So I think uh, I'm getting signs here. Would, okay, so I'm going to pray, tie this out, and I hope you guys got what I was trying to say. Okay. God, thank you so much for the freedom you have given us. Thank you so much, God, that you've opened our eyes to see what what enslavement is, Lord, to sin, and what freedom is in you, in, in Christ, Lord. That, Lord, we couldn't do it, but you sent Christ, because you love us, Lord. You sent Christ to, to set us free, Lord, but not to keep that freedom, but to share it with others, Lord. And so I just pray, Lord, that today you instill in us a desire to reach more, to talk to more people, Lord, to help them, uh, guide them to you, Lord, to show them, Lord, that their ways are enslaving, and show them that, Lord, you have really freed us, uh, I thank you for everyone here today, Lord, and I pray that if there was any uh, stuttering or any impediment on my part, that it may have still gotten through. Uh, in your name we pray, Lord. Amen. Amen. Woo!